So to commemorate the release of Dragon's Quest XI on the Switch back in September, Hori released another version of their Slime controller. It's reminiscent of the Slime controllers that they've released in the past on the PS2 and on the PS4. Now this was only released in Japan, so I've had to import this. I pre-ordered it back in June, the game and the controller came out in September, and I received this in the post about a month later. So what we're going to do, we're going to unbox this thing, we're going to see what comes in the box, I'm going to try it out on a few games. Hello fellow gamers, and I'm going to be trying out the new slime controller for Nintendo Switch. Look at that face. Right, let's get down to unboxing this thing. Something that actually surprised me about this before I even unbox it is it's got uh, an all plastic outer case and which is kind of strange given today's anti-plastic society. But we don't need to worry about this ending up in any kind of landfill or anything. Now of course straight away you can notice that there's some Japanese texts all over the box. Um, unfortunately I don't speak Japanese. But I did stick the Google Translate onto the speech bubble here. So apparently this translates to not a bad slime wireless controller. That's modest. Now this text in the corner I wasn't able to translate fully but from what I can understand I think it's saying that it doesn't have NFC or HD rumble or a motion IR camera. So after taking a knife to the sticky labels on the sides we're finally able to get into this thing. Now the texture on this controller is actually kind of weird, it's uh, it's smoothed out but it's also got a kind of uh, rubberized matte texture to it at the same time. I think it's supposed to help with uh, improving the grip, but finally being able to hold this in my hands, oh, it's so adorable. All of the buttons and joysticks are on the underside, and a quick test of all the buttons, uh, everything seemed okay. Um, the main face button seemed a bit on the spongy side, but you'll notice straight away that it's got the PlayStation 4 layout rather than a Switch or Xbox uh, joystick layout. This makes me think that it's uh, pretty much based on the same mould as the PlayStation 4 slime controller. But the joysticks felt really good, they were responsive, and there was an extra kind of uh, grippy texture on the D-pad as well. What's kind of strange is uh, the D-pad and the a, B, X, Y buttons. They curve outwards, which doesn't feel intuitive. I think this would have been more comfortable if uh, they turned inwards instead. But everything's accounted for. The LR, ZL, ZR buttons are all there, and they're quite easy to reach as well. And there is a USB-C charging port as well. What you can also see there is a turbo button. I don't think I need to explain what turbo buttons actually do, but the way this one works is you hold down the button and you press another button that you want to make turbo, so you can make any button pretty much on this controller a turbo button. There's another button at the bottom there, but I'm not sure exactly what that's for. I think it could be a sync button? Not too sure. So my initial impressions at this point was I was a bit dubious as to whether this would be a comfortable controller to hold, but it's such a lovely little thing to own. So I'm continuing on with the unboxing here, and there's more in the base of the box as well. I don't know any Japanese, I couldn't read any of this, so I just carried on. But inside, the first thing you see is a instruction manual, of course, all in Japanese. But I figured, well, it's a controller, so how hard can it be? What we also found in here was actually an alarmingly short USB Type-C cable. Now if we're just going to be using this for charging or pairing up this controller, I'm not sure if a short cable would have been useful, but I for one welcome having a short cable. It seems that any USB Type-C cables that I get are at least a metre long, and quite frankly I don't need all of that length all the time, so it's, it's really handy to have a short one. Next in here is a little base, a little stand for your controller to sit on. Now of course the, the buttons and the joysticks are at the bottom and you don't want to be putting unnecessary pressure on those. So you can just place the slime controller onto the stand and you can keep it on display. The two joysticks just fit in snugly into those little like, crevices and it makes for a nice display piece. The last item that was in the box is this uh, little fold up cardboard treasure chest. With the idea being that uh, you just assemble this and you can, 
you can put your switch on it, it acts like a switch stand. And when you're not using your switch, you can place the slime controller on the top, just keeps it all together. It was at this point that I thought, great, all of the time I've spent with Labo is really starting to pay off now. And there we go, the finished piece. So we just put our switch on there, and then the slime controller can sit there on the top. Nice. Now we've got this out of the box, how well does it work as a controller? Now at the point of the unboxing, I didn't have any of the Dragon Quest games installed on my Switch. So I queued them up to download and in the meantime I tried this controller out on other titles just to see how it fared. Mario Kart! So the first game that I tried this out on was Mario Kart 8 Deluxe. I went through a whole GP to try out this controller. And I can report straight away that the joysticks are actually really good. They're very smooth, they're very responsive, they're very accurate. What I didn't like though was the positioning of the buttons. Its shape though, when it comes to an intensive game, is a bit of a hindrance. You know, so you've got the buttons curving outwards, but of course when you're holding a controller, naturally, your hands are going to be curving inwards. And that makes it rather uncomfortable. In my opinion, this controller probably isn't ideal for intense playing. Throughout all of the races, I was finding myself wanting handles for extra grip. So I thought, okay, let's simplify this. How about Mario Kart on the SNES instead? Now even though the, all of the buttons were facing outwards, this actually worked pretty well. The buttons were a little bit on the mushy side, however, it made it quite difficult for me to accelerate and use an item at the same time. But the shoulder buttons are in a pretty good location and I was able to drift around corners pretty easily. So I thought, okay, if this worked for Super Mario Kart... Let's try it on a simple platformer, Super Mario World. Now on this, it worked really well, I thought. Uh, these spongy buttons weren't any problem and I was able to play it just fine. And the texture on the D-pad helped with getting added grip when moving around. Now by this time, the demo for the Dragon Quest Builders 2 game had finally downloaded, so we gave it a whirl. I have given the first one a quick go. It seemed alright, I mean I do like Minecraft, so uh, this was rather up my street. And the second one does seem to run a bit smoother. There seems to be a bit more detail in it. Now what works in its favour is that it's not a high octane game. You can go at your own pace. Which means that you don't need to worry about holding the controller firmly. You can just sit back and relax, and when I was playing through this game, the slime controller worked really well for it. A little later, the demo for Dragon Quest XI had downloaded, and now is the time to try out the official Dragon Quest controller with the actual game. Now, I will be honest, I've never played a mainline Dragon Quest game before. This is my first one. Now, it's, it's very much the same like it is with Dragon Quest Builders 2. This isn't a high-octane RPG. You can take your time with your moves and wandering around the place. And again, that meant that you don't need to worry about having extra grip on your controller, so you can just sit back and relax. And again, this controller worked really well for that. Now, this is only a demo, but I found that uh, most of it is really about uh, wandering around, and when you get into battles, uh, you take turns in it. So you can take your time and uh, choose what you're going to do. That's assuming, of course, that it doesn't automatically start attacking for you, which is what it did for me most of the time. But I will say, all in all, the controller works fine with Dragon Quest XI as well. But it also works fine with the Pro Controller, which is 60 quid. It also works fine with an 8-bit Do Controller, which is under 40 quid. And it also works fine with the Joy-Con, which you should already have with your Switch. Whereas this Slime Controller is about £100. Yikes! So what do I think of the Slam controller for the Switch? Well, it's definitely very well made. Well, I mean, it's hurry at the end of the day. It's a very well made product. And it's perfectly fine for games which aren't overly intensive. Now, since this was only released in Japan, you're going to have to import it. And it's going to cost you 100 quid, if not more. So to summarise, if you've got 100 quid burning a hole in your pocket and you're a big fan of Dragon Quest, go nuts. But because of the way it's shaped, it's not a very comfortable controller for anything any more intensive than playing a 
standard RPG. So if you're thinking of playing Smash with this, good luck to you. Thanks so much for watching. Be sure to let me know what you thought of the video with a like or dislike down below, or even leave a comment about your experiences with the slime controller, be it on the Switch or on the PS4, or heck, even on the PS2. Again, thanks for watching, and I'll catch you all next time.